Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham. Uh, in this segment, we're going to discuss uh, uh, two uh, separate uh, topics. Primarily, we're going to look at protein purification, how one goes about purifying these macromolecules that we they were in the midst of talking about. And then toward the end, we're going to take a few minutes and look at how to understand how to think about the evolution of the sequence of these pro uh, proteins uh, that will uh, turn out to serve us uh, well as we move forward. So remember what proteins are. They're typical linear uh, polymers uh, made up of amino acids. We've talked in detail about the structure of amino acids. We'll return to the structure of proteins in later segments. Here we're going to be focused, as I said, on their um, purification. And by being able to purify proteins, we can retrieve these various molecular engines and catalysts and tools that organisms make in such profusion and begin to say their individual properties, as, as in fact has been done extensively over the last century and a half. So let me begin by giving you a sense of scale here. So there are five uh, proteins uh, on this little table, and the number of amino acid residues making up those proteins are indicated, all the way from the smallest one on this table, the B chain of the insulin uh, hormone, uh, 30 amino acids, up to a massive protein uh, called titan, a muscle protein in humans, of over 34,000 residues. In point of fact, however, these uh, two large and small uh, proteins are quite unusual. Uh, the proteins in the middle of the table here, ranging from 100 residues to roughly 1,000 residues, are much more common. So of the thousands, over 20,000 genes that uh, uh, exist in the human genome, for example, the vast majority of those proteins are in this range of 100 to 1,000 residues. And in this segment, in the next couple of segments, we're going to be looking predominantly at pr uh, proteins of that sort. The question now is, how do we get our hands on a purified version of a protein? Stop and think what our problem is here. If you lyse a piece of human tissue, for example, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 15,000 proteins in that uh, uh, lysate. How can you pull out the one you're particularly interested in? It's a formidable task. And in fact, as you'll see over the next few minutes, the way we go about it is to sequentially apply a whole series of different purifications, each one giving us a partial purification, culminating, if we care to go that far in complete purification of the protein. And I'll give you a sense of the kind of tools that we can use uh, for that purpose. Let's begin, though, with a more rudimentary thing we have to contend with, and that is how do we keep track of the proteins that, that we're working with, and in particular the one that we're interested in. There are basically two things we need to be able to do. We need to be able to, to measure the bulk amount of protein that we have, so we have an idea of how far along the pathway to purification we are. And then we need to be able to measure the particular protein that we happen to be interested in. So let's deal with the bulk protein measurement. First, one really easy way to do this is with UV absorbance. So let me say right away that the wavelengths that we're going to be of light that we're going to be working with here are in the ultraviolet. They're, in other words, too short for us to see. In the visible spectrum, where you and I see, proteins uh, absorb not at all. They're colorless. But they are extremely colored in the UV spectrum. That's what this diagram is here. What we're looking at, at is the absorbance of ultraviolet light by three different amino acids. Remember your single letter code. W is tryptophan, Y is tyrosine, F is phenylalanine. And along the horizontal axis, the wavelength of light is being changed. And on the vertical axis, the amount of absorbance of that amino acid is being measured. So you shine the light through a tube with transparent aqueous solution in it, and you put the amino acid in and ask how much of the light that you're shining into the tube that should go all the way through the tube doesn't make it because it's being absorbed by the amino acid. And that's what you're plotting on the vertical axis here. And this is a log axis. So these amino acids are absorbing tremendous amounts of, of uh, light at, in the ultraviolet. So in fact, in the wavelength range, say around 280 or down around 220, uh, you, you can measure the amount of protein quite nicely in bulk by measuring the amount of UV absorbance in the particular solution uh, at the particular stage in purification that you happen to be working at. Now let's turn attention to how you keep track of the particular protein you're interested in. The answer to that question, of course, is that there are if there are 20,000 genes, there are 20,000 answers. Each protein has its own assay. So if you're interested in an RNA polymerase, for example, you might set up a little assay in which you give each fraction in your purification a DNA template, some uh, triphosphate precursors, and ask it to make RNA off of the DNA template. But there are, again, a million variations on this theme. There's another sort of generic assay, though, that can be quite useful in keeping track of a protein, and in, in many other circumstances, and that's diagrammed on this image. It's, qual it's what's called an ELISA assay, an enzyme-linked immunoabsorption assay. Uh, 
And what it depends upon is having two independent antibodies that bind to different places on the same protein of interest. You then purify those antibodies and you bind one of them to an insoluble substrate. And there are many different ways of doing that. The commercial project products that let you do that, for example. That's symbolized here as the green upside down uh, circle, little Pac-Man on the top line here. You then expose your fraction or extract to that bound antibody, and your protein will bind to the antigen binding site on the antibody. Your protein here is symbolized as the blue cross. You then wash off all of the extra proteins, and now you put the second antibody to your protein, symbolized here by the, the um, orange shape, and to that antibody you've joined an enzyme. And there are various ways to do that as well. And that enzyme will generate some kind of signal that you can measure. It might burn ATP and emit light, for example. Or it might catalyze a reaction that produces an insoluble colored substrate that you can measure. Various ways of going about it. But as a result, you wash off the unbound antibody. Only the antibody, the second antibody bound to your protein, bound to the first antibody, is still there for you to measure. And you can, in fact, keep track of where your protein is. So the crucial point to absorb here is that there are uh, lots of different ways of going about monitoring a particular protein that you're interested in, and the first step in learning to purify a protein is finding an assay that will work for you. Now, the s supposing that you have that assay, now the question is, how do you proceed to begin to purify a protein? There's some very well established now, people have been working doing this kind of thing for, for um, not quite a century, uh, m many decades, and there's some sort of well worked out approaches to doing this. And we're gonna, I'm going to take you through a couple of those really well worked out approaches. This uh, slide symbolizes something called salting out. So remember uh, how water interacts with macromolecules. The hydrophobic parts tend to be folded inside away from water, and there are hydrophilic parts projecting outwards, interacting with the water, as we've talked about in earlier segments. But if you start putting salt into that solution, the salt molecules will compete with the hydrophilic portions on the surface of the molecules to interact with water. And if they start bumping the water off those molecules, those molecules will coalesce with one another, fall out of solution, and precipitate. It's called salting out. Sulfate salts turned out to be particularly effective at doing this, and ammonium sulfate is the sort of standard sulfate salt that many protein chemists use. Let's now look at this image, and your protein, the one you're interested in, is symbolized here in blue. Two proteins you're not interested in are symbolized in pink and white. So having done a little analytical experiment to know when your protein is going to precipitate, you then take this big bulk prep that you want to purify lots of protein out of, and what you do then is add just enough ammonium sulfate to precipitate uh, proteins other than yours. In other words, just short of what will pr precipitate your protein. That's what you've done in tube B. You then take that tube and spin it in a centrifuge to cause the big particles to sediment and the soluble proteins stay up. You take the supernatant off, leave the insoluble proteins behind, including the pink protein here, in which you're not interested. Then you add a little bit more ammonium sulfate, just enough to precipitate your protein, symbolized in blue here. Spin it down, and now your protein is in the pellet, in the precipitate. You take off the supernatant containing the white protein in which you're not interested, uh, uh, and then redissolve that pellet in a low salt solution in which it is now soluble again. This is called an ammonium sulfate cut in the jargon of protein purification, and it's a very effective way to kind of get rid of 90% of the extraneous proteins. This pellet won't just won't be pure here. You're not working with a mixture of three proteins. You're working with a mixture of thousands. So in fact, there'll be a number of other proteins in the pellet, but you will have achieved a substantial uh, purification. First step. Now the question is, how could you take that precipitate, partly purified, and put it through other purification steps, which would ultimately get you to the point where you had a pure sample of the protein you care about? And and the next few minutes, we'll run through a set of procedures that will let you do that. So let's start with one of the most common ones, what's called ion exchange chromatography. I'm going to walk you through this slightly complicated diagram in a moment, but let's be clear what we're dealing with first. So in this column, as it's called, this uh, yellow, orangish yellow uh, substance in this glass tube, this glass column, is millions of little beads, one of which is diagrammed here. These beads are just structural support, and then on their surface are attached resins, molecules that have chemically active groups on them. So for example, there might be uh, they might have lots of positively charged groups on them, and therefore they would tend to bind negatively charged things. Negatively charged things are called anions, so it would tend to be uh, to bind anions. And this column would be called an anion exchange column. And why it's called that will be exchange will be a little more obvious in a moment. Or alternatively, it could have a positive charge on it, in which case uh, I'm sorry. It could <laughs>